Hi, everyone. Welcome to the seminar. Thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate having everyone here on this rather hot day. Um, I call it skirt day because uh, I think it's a good day to uh, actually be warm in Berkeley. Um, so we are very pleased today to have uh, our friend Chris Finan join us. Um, Chris is the CEO and co-founder of Manifold Technology, a Silicon Valley based startup that addresses security and governance challenges in advanced infrastructure. Uh, Chris previously led business development for Imperium, a cybersecurity startup acquired by Google. Prior to that, he was the product director for Plan X, a Department of Defense cyber warfare research and development program at DARPA. He served in the Obama administration as director for cybersecurity legislation and policy on the NSC staff in, at the White House. Uh, began his career as a pilot in the US Air Force, and uh, that included a tour to Iraq. Um, he's focused on building a world-class team at Manifold and bringing the platform to market to give enterprises visibility and control of advanced um, infrastructure. Uh, we are so thrilled to have you here today um, and uh, look forward to your presentation. So thanks again. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Um, thank you for spending your lunch with me. I really appreciate it. And uh, I'm really hoping that we can not have any distractions, uh, but also create uh, a meaningful discussion. So my style is very informal, very Northern California. Um, and uh, you know what I'm going to talk about today really is just um, a, an interesting topic that I think doesn't lend itself to easy solutions. Um, my guess is we have a lot of smart people in the room. So I'm very interested to hear uh, what you guys think, and I hope we can spur a meaningful discussion. Um, it might be helpful if I, I give you a little bit more context about myself so you know my perspective, uh, my beliefs, but also my biases. Uh, I always think that's really important so you know uh, the perspective of the, uh, of the speaker. Um, so I worked in DC on cybersecurity policy. Uh, it was a great honor to work in the White House uh, for the president uh, on this. Uh, I, and and I, I would think that I think regardless of, of uh, partisanship, you know, just working for uh, the office itself, uh, not only did I have a great belief in the man and his values, but also in the office at that time. But it was a fascinating time to be working on national cybersecurity policy because um, there was very little uh, plowed ground, if you will. Uh, the debate was still in its, its really early stages. And uh, if you think about the, the sort of legal frameworks that we're dealing with as a country, much of those national level laws and policies were based in the telephony era. Uh, they sort of came to be during that era, and they haven't That's kept pace. They haven't kept pace mm -hmm. with uh, with changing technology, and and that was one thing that I I definitely learned while I was there was that policy always lags technology, and so as a result, when you think about policy responses to uh, to issues that are often exacerbated or even created by technology, you really need to think about responses that have a lot of play in the joints so that they can grow and live as the technology advances. Uh, and so I think in particular when you're trying to tackle issues like uh, national cybersecurity risks, uh, or even what we're going to talk about today in terms of data manipulation, which I would consider a, a subcategory of those, um, you really need to think about responses that uh, can evolve as the landscape and the technology changes. And um, you know, one of the things that I, I really gained an appreciation for when I was there principally because we had such an adversarial Congress and we had um, a lot of special interest groups that began to come in and try to sway the debate based on their, their business interests or their, uh, their lobbying groups uh, focus. Um, you know, this was all new to me. Uh, I had been a, a military officer and just kind of, you know, grown up playing around with technology. I uh, had a startup company before and uh, was just trying to, you know, do some good. And I came into this sort of uh, Viper's nest of, of just competing interests, right? And all we really wanted to do was, you know, just make the country a little bit safer, just update the laws. That was really my, my focus was how do we create comp comprehensive cybersecurity legislative reform so that we can uh, mitigate the risks to critical infrastructure systems across the nation. So that was really my focus. Uh, that seems to be something that we could get a lot of consensus that hey, these laws are out of date, these risks are growing. If you talk to any technologist or expert, they'll tell you this is a, a big problem. And yet, we couldn't generate enough consensus for, for true action. And so, you know, one of the things that I learned early on was you really need to think about not only policies that can be effective, 
but how can you generate policies that can co-opt groups to align incentives? Because that's really the only way you're going to get things done. And uh, that's been interesting now as I've gone into the private sector uh, and, and had the privilege of working with now a lot of the former, uh, same former people that I worked with in government uh, and kind of learning now how to work in the private sector with that same mindset of aligning incentives. And so Manifold Technology, the, the startup that I founded with uh, a former National Security Agency uh, cryptographer named Rob Seeger, we got together two and a half years ago and we said, um, you know, we're tired of sort of just building a better cybersecurity mousetrap. That was, we had startups in the past and, you know, that it, it's interesting, but we wanted to do something more meaningful. And for us, um, we love applied cryptography. Um, we feel like uh, security should not be an end in and of itself. It should be a means toward something better, right? And I, I think that often in these debates gets conflated. Uh, the cyber, what does that mean if you guys watched the debate last night? <laughs> <time? laughs> it, it's, it should be a means to, to address something, right? You're trying to make systems a little bit more secure. Uh, you can make them totally secure by turning them off or unplugging them, uh, but then what, what good does that do anybody? And so when Rob and I sat down and we said, you know, what problem is it that we want to solve? Um, the idea of um, data manipulation uh, and, and solving that at scale or creating systems that could solve that at scale. And so you heard in the introduction, advanced threats to infrastructure, what does that really mean? Uh, we focus on tamper-proofing technology. So um, uh, there's a lot of hype around, you, you'll hear the term blockchain. I, I, I personally don't like that term. I think um, immutable uh, data stores have been around for some time. Uh, we build highly scalable, immutable data scores, if you're familiar with that technology, and I can, I can go much more into it. Uh, I don't necessarily want to make this a tech-focused discussion unless there's a lot of interest, and we can certain, certainly take things in that direction. What I'd hope to do today, and I just have a couple slides that are really just guidance for us, I really just hope to spur a discussion about um, my thesis, which is, uh, I'll bring it up since I made the slide. Um, <laughs> that actually manipulating data, undermining the integrity of systems is, uh, I think in the, in the pitch I said, a more perni pernicious threat. But it's the, the graver threat, if you will, uh, than simple theft or disruption. Now, of course, that's a huge generality. Um, but I want to give you some ideas, and I, I'm hoping to at least spur some discussion. And if you feel otherwise, please push back. Uh, I don't have a lot of pride of ownership here. I really just am, am testing this thesis because uh, I'll give you a couple stories for why I think this is, but I think that we've, um, in some respects, become so focused on sort of the near-term risks of uh, people ripping us off, you know, uh, hacker stealing and, and um, uh, breaching databases to monetize things like credentials that we're, we're failing to see the forest from the trees. And, uh, you know, when I think about what kept people up at night in the West Wing, uh, in the East, uh, the E-ring of the Pentagon, um, it, it wasn't that systems could be brought down, it's that systems could be manipulated such that they could a spiral out of control, bring down the national economy, uh, cause people to lose faith in their bank or in um, you know, the system writ large. And so um, I think there needs to be more focus on data integrity. Um, you know, if you, if you go back to sort of uh, core security tenants, confidentiality, integrity, availability, uh, we've tend, tended, at least in cybersecurity policy, to put a lot of emphasis on confidentiality, um, some emphasis on availability, very little emphasis on integrity. And so I think we need to bring this into the policy debates as context uh, to talk more about the importance of integrity. Uh, and obviously, um, this isn't zero sum. You can have one and the other. Uh, but I'd like to think about ways that we could spur greater focus on integrity, and that's kind of what I hope to talk about today with you guys. So um, what I thought we could do first was just talk a little bit about some risks, and I've, I've got some things that I've outlined. Uh, hopefully this will spur some ideas, and I'd, I'd love to hear them. Uh, and then a little bit about mitigation, and that's where I'm, I'm hoping we can get into more of a discussion. You know, I, I tend to be pretty opinionated when it comes to policy responses. Um, and I will generally offer some, some prescriptions or some ideas often that just I'll wake up at night and say, hey, you know what we need is a, a natural, national breach notification law. And if we structure it correctly, we can use it as an incentive to drive greater investment. I didn't do that in this talk, uh, A, because I figured we were probably going to have a lot of opinionated people in the audience. Uh, but B, because I don't know that I really had a, a, a good idea 
And I'm hoping that maybe we can generate some today. So uh, this is from the New York Times a couple weeks ago. Um, pretty recent story. And um, you know what I think is really interesting about that, and we were talking about uh, Russia uh, a little earlier. Um, if you look at Russian information warfare doctrine, um, disinformation, disinformatia, I probably uh, butchered that word, uh, is a core part of that. And the idea that uh, not only are you um, stealing data, not only are you trying to breach systems, but you're actually going in there for the purposes of um, manipulating information, but not just manipulating data, manipulating information and creating new narratives or even false narratives. Um, and when you think about this at scale, and, and I should mention, my background is sort of national level, uh, systems level, uh, so I, I like to be thinking about these problems at scale. When you think about this disinformation campaign at scale, that's when you can really get into uh, a, a delegitimization or, or an undermining of political institutions. And that's where I think you know, we've got some really systemic risks that we should be thinking about. Okay, total eye chart. Um, by the way, all of these um, graphics I found online. There's like no official information, uh, complete disc disclaimer. Everything I say has nothing to do with the government or the Obama administration. Um, they're, all, they're all my own uh, ideas. I found this online and um, really what I wanted to highlight here is um, the first risk and that is the risk to command and control systems. What do I mean by that? Um, this is just the way that we communicate uh, for the purposes of, of some type of military action. You know, the, the old chain of command. President tells uh, the CENTCOM commander, I want you to go and invade Iraq. Uh, go do it. It's that chain of command um, that actually sends um, orders uh, throughout the military to then go and take action around the world. Um, where, of course, this is highly consequential is when you're talking about things like uh, missile defense, when you're talking about things like um, air defense, uh, you know, defending the U.S. from, from air invasion, uh, or if you're talking about a nuclear strike, uh, either responding to or, you know, some, t some type of first strike, which I don't think we do. Um, but nonetheless, uh, this system is, uh, has been uh, created uh, and updated, though to a lesser extent recently, uh, over the past 40 or 50 years. Uh, it is incredibly complex. It has many, many layers. Uh, you can see here that there's some RF layers, uh, that is radio frequency communication. Uh, there are ground system layers, there are satellite layers, and all of this has to work in, con in concert. Um, the bottom line is that this is an uh, incredibly complicated communication system. And, um, you know, for any of the hackers in the audience, you know that uh, anything that's complicated generally also means fragility. Uh, and um, I, I think there tends to be an assumption that uh, because much of this is isolated, these systems are isolated, whether it's using um, logic or whether it's using uh, dedicated infrastructure, uh, that it's inherently secure. And if there's one thing that we've learned uh, over the past decade, uh, that assumption uh, isn't necessarily true. And so. What I would submit to you uh, is that complicated systems like this uh, are not only at risk for disruption, but potentially at risk for uh, information and data manipulation. And uh, again, when you think about risks in terms of uh, consequence, uh, this would be incredibly consequential, consequential uh, not least of which uh, in a scenario in which false data were inserted, but even, uh, I believe, a scenario in which uh, there's concern about the integrity of the system because that's a very destabilizing scenario. Uh, so much like we're now learning with uh, the current uh, concern about election rigging or tampering, uh, particularly by a foreign power, we know that uh, the system could be facing instability uh, just because of that perception that it could happen. Uh, now, what if you're sitting in one of these operation centers and you now have a concern that the data that you're seeing may not be correct because somebody has breached your system. Uh, that is incredibly destabilizing and probably uh, would incentivize a first strike. And so um, just the, the risk or concern, and if you can insert that, um, particularly if you, have, if you were a third party and you wanted to stir things up, um, such as a, an extremist group, 
uh, that would be one way to incentivize a first strike and really destabilize, uh, particularly this, this um, area of the world. And by the way, uh, I, I found these online, um, which uh, is pretty crazy. And again, you'll see like some of the other stuff I found. It's pretty crazy what you can find out there. Um, but I, I think this scenario in particular um, is a really concerning one. And when we get into mitigation, um, I've got some interesting ideas that I'd love to just throw out there. But again, I just wanted to sort of walk through the risk landscape and, and appreciate some, some uh, different, different scenarios. When people ask me uh, what kept people in the Pentagon up at night, uh, this is it. And you might be like, what? Military logistics, who cares? Um, well, it turns out that 90% uh, of um, how we deploy our military forces around the world, how we send them you know, beans, butter, fuel, uh, all of those things. And there's this old adage uh, in the military that uh, novices st study strategy, experts study logistics. And um, here's why. Uh, because any time we go somewhere, our troops are highly dependent on fuel, on water. Uh, and if we can't get those things to them, the machine basically stops. And so there is an enormous infrastructure in place uh, just to ensure that we can get things like fuel bombs, um, clothing, even the troops themselves to the right place and time. Um, what's really interesting is that uh, approximately 90% of that logistical coordination is done via um, non-military systems. What do I mean by that? I mean systems that generally operate uh, either within or on top of uh, internet infrastructure uh, or other, some other type of uh, you know, non-government infrastructure. And um, when I went to uh, Transcom, US Transportation Command is the command that in charge of all of this. It, sir, I'll get to you in a second. Uh, the general there, General McDo, uh, is, is very concerned about this. Uh, it's something that a lot of people are aware of, but uh, I will tell you um, it doesn't lend itself uh, to an easy solution because um, there's one solution, which is just to, to do everything with military equipment, you know, to, to own the ships and, and do everything over unclassified system. That would be completely cost prohibitive. We leverage FedEx. We le leverage commercial shipping. Uh, to move these troops and move these uh, tankers around. And so you could imagine uh, if you were trying to coordinate via a web portal with FedEx to ship something around the world, um, you know, maybe you've got uh, some, some cryptography, that some public key um, infrastructure that you're using to do that to try to make it secure. Um, but I always encourage people to, to think about what happens if those credentials are compromised. Um, I think that's always a very good uh, assumption and starting point. Uh, and then you can see that uh, this becomes uh, a concern very quickly. Yes, sir, you had a question or comment. I was just wondering if that 90% number has been constant over like, what, you know, or if it's becoming more private. That's a good, that's a good question. Um, I believe, I've seen, I, I, I went back and, and tried to at least uh, see if that was consistent with what I'd heard when I was at Transcom. Uh, I saw that number as early as 2002. So I think at least for the last decade or so, that number's been relatively consistent. When people ask me what kept people in the West Wing up at night, um, this is it. Um, and again, you know, think about it just in your own uh, online behavior. You know, if, if you were to go to your um, to your bank's um, web app or even you know, uh, to, their, um, to their mobile app and uh, try to access your information and it were down, you're probably like, oh, whatever. You probably wouldn't leave this room. You'd probably say, I'll, I'll check later. Um, but it, you know, if, you got, if you saw a news alert that said uh, you know, your bank's data and all the account information had been changed, you would probably freak out. Um, it's like the Mr. Robot scenario, if you guys watch that show. Um, and so it, it's the undermining of the systems themselves uh, that causes people to lose faith. And you know, the, the in incredible honor of working in the White House was in part getting to think about things in terms of national consequences. You know, what will happen if the nation writ large loses face, faith in the economic system? 
uh, that directly undermines our national economic security, probably also our national security when you think about the implications. And um, I would argue that um, that is a much more dangerous scenario than simply if the NASDAQ were to go offline or if its uh, website were to be DOSed. And so um, in early 2011, uh, this was something that uh, was a huge focus uh, at the very highest levels of government uh, because there, were, there had been a, an intrusion at NASDAQ and for a period of, uh, a, a, a short period of time, uh, no one really knew how deeply the intrusion had penetrated and whether the core trading systems were affected. Uh, and this was a real concern. Uh, so I will tell you that, uh, and that's an actual picture of uh, the NASDAQ infrastructure. Of course, much of this is backed up, um, but there are scenarios where um, uh, e even that uh, backup data could be corrupted. And so, again, thinking about how do you incentivize the type of tamper-proofing uh, that would guarantee that integrity, uh, I think is, is something to consider. Um, okay, last risk, uh, probably the mo most proximate one uh, for us today. And I, I promise you, uh, we had settled, I think, on this topic before this. Um, it wasn't just marketing. Uh, right, so the research is really compelling. I, I felt like I was um, pretty familiar with a lot of the research. But again, in preparation for this, I just, in the last couple of days, have been reading through some of the academic research. And uh, it is amazing um, how easy these systems are to manipulate. Now, I will caveat that. You know, one of the great things about our society is that there's an incredible amount of diversity, including in the, you know, federalist approach, right, where you've got uh, different layers of government uh, that operate relatively independently. Uh, that is certainly true of how we do elections. And so as a result, you tend to get a, a lot of diversity in the actual election infrastructure. However, because of the 2000 uh, election uh, debac debacle that happened, Congress passed a law that granted states um, grants to purchase new election technology. Most of them went out and tried to buy the most fancy technology out there, uh, touch screen, uh, much of which lacked any sort of paper backup. And we're still, uh, unfortunately, and so there ended up being quite a bit of standardization between 2002 when that law was passed and 2006 when the funding expired those four years. Uh, so there were a lot of purchases made of that technology during that time period and we're still dealing with the consequences of that. Um, despite the best intentions of uh, Andrew Apple, who's at Princeton, and a lot of other uh, academic researchers of really trying to shine a spotlight on this problem, uh, this is still a systemic risk. So we still have quite a bit of um, homogeneity uh, in that election infrastructure, uh, even though how it's being used can differ quite a bit from county to county. Uh, although, you know, you can envision a scenario where just a few key counties, you know, Montgomery County in Pennsylvania uh, could be the key to this entire election. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, it doesn't really take um, uh, a successful effort to undermine a system. You can do that with just the mere threat, a plausible threat of being able to undermine a system, particularly when um, detecting data manipulation can be so difficult to do. What if you have a paper map? Is that a uh, yes, I, I, I do believe it does. Um, here's the problem with that. Uh, if it's something that's printed out post hoc after you actually do the vote, um, what generally ends up happening, you know, eight out of ten people maybe look at it, um, maybe they don't, and they just throw it away out as they go out the door. A much better approach now, uh, people have realized that problem, is optical scanning, you know, the bubble test. Uh, and so that's what you see now. You, you actually fill out the paper backup before you walk in. Uh, and then the machine scans it and then tallies it. So you automatically have that receipt. So, so that's now generally where most people are going. Although now we're still, we're seeing a push by some municipalities for online voting. And online voting, that's not just really, you know, using cryptography, just like open databases uh, that, are, that are being used by some municipalities. So I think we have a long way to go to educate not only the public, but also some of the local election officials about these risks. But yeah, I think if you've got an audit trail, uh, a paper audit trail, you're, you're probably good. I would even say uh, a cryptographic auto trail, but I think most people are, are I think that, that technology is a little too complicated for most people to really feel comfortable with. Okay. Um, <laughs> there are so many pictures like this, by the way, uh, some of which are completely inappropriate. I, I felt like this was a good happy medium. <laughs> 
Um, scary. Anyway, uh, so what I, what I thought we could do now is just talk a little bit about responses. How much time do we have? You have about 17 minutes. Okay, perfect. <laughs> um, so here's the cool thing that I'll say from, from my, of course, biased uh, vendor perspective. Um, I do find that not only in the research community, in the open source uh, development community, and also now in the commercial vendor side, a lot more interest in developing uh, immutable um, or data integrity guaranteeing technologies. So we see a lot of really great open source projects. If you're familiar with Git, uh, that has some integrity guarantees uh, inherent in the uh, in the infrastructure. Uh, we're seeing a lot of really cool um, immutable database uh, data store projects now. Um, as I mentioned, blockchain, of course, really um, became very popular uh, because of Bitcoin. That now has spurred a lot of enterprise technology. That's what our company does, um, which is really just self-referencing hashes, right? It's, it's an immutable data store that can be shared uh, similar to Git. Um, and th that tends to be known as distributed ledger technology uh, more commonly. Um, when, I, when you think about um, you know, tech uh, mitigations, tech uh, responses, uh, again, I like to really encourage people to say, don't rely on PKI. Because we've seen again and again and again, if it's not implemented well, um, if the keys aren't properly protected, you know, if they're stored in the same uh, in the same server that's been compromised, um, what good is it going to do you? So, from a planning perspective, from a a policy response perspective, I think it's really good to encourage people uh, to think about what happens when those credentials have been compromised. Um, does that bring down your entire system? Does that allow somebody to come in and manipulate all of the messages that are traveling through it? Likewise, uh, if, Stuck, if Stuxnet taught us one thing, uh, it's that air gapping um, for a sophisticated adversary uh, is a, um, an insufficient um, mitigation technique. Um, and then as I said, what's really cool about these new technologies, uh, not only is that they're becoming more pervasive, it's that the cost has fallen. It's that, um, you know, one of the reasons why uh, databases have been were designed to be mutable was because storage costs were very expensive, uh, computing power was scarce. Um, I would argue there's really no reason we shouldn't have immutable data stores um, at this day and age. And so now the scalability of these systems is making them much more viable. But we don't see, uh, we still don't see investment really driving that. This is generally driven by research or people who just want to kind of build new tech not necessarily by specific demand signals. Now, there are some uh, notable exceptions to that, but most of the uh, technology development is still coming from the research and, and R&D communities. Yes. Yes, exactly. So, um, conceptually speaking, um, just as a baseline, uh, typically what happens in a database uh, is uh, a, a piece of data will be assigned to a cell in a database. Uh, when new data comes in, um, that can be overwritten uh, if it's out of date, uh, if it's not protected. And so you end up uh, losing a lot of uh, the historical um, state of that data, okay? Um, new immutable data databases keep that state or that history of data uh, and never write over it over time. Uh, and why is that important? Um, Let's take the example of a distributed ledger because I think it's very easily conceptualized. Um, something like Bitcoin, why does it work? It works because you've got a mathematical proof of every transaction all the way back to the very first transaction. Uh, so I give Betsy a dollar, she goes out to the vending machine, buys a Coke, the Coke company gets, Coca-Cola company gets 50 cents, uh, she keeps the other 50 cents, right? So we see that entire transaction history, and that's what provides the integrity, because we know things haven't been doubly spent. Um, and so that's really what we're talking about when we're talking about immutable uh, records of this. It's that you get not only the state at the time, uh, you get the entire history of the data. But, uh, yes, sir. In terms of the technology, is it like physical technology like CDs that you were what would be the other oh, I see. Uh, you, you generally would be using cryptography. You'd be using um, a mathematical proof, usually a hash of the data. 
Uh, and so what you're doing is you're performing a mathematical function on the data. Uh, and you're then taking the result of that mathematical function and you're including it with the next um, data that's being written. And so you, you generate a timeline of events of data put, being put into the record and so that you can go back and you know, and a good way to think about it, I like to think about it, are those reams of paper that you buy at, at Staples, those, uh, the boxes with the reams of paper in them. Imagine we had four or five of those lined up on the table. Um, well, we know, you know, if I put my phone in one, I put my notebook in the other, I put this thing in the third, um, and I stretch a line of tape over those boxes, I know as long as uh, that tape hasn't been tampered with, I know exactly what is in each one of those boxes. And if I write the time on there, I know when it was put in there. Uh, and so um, the cryptography is the tape on top. When people talk about a blockchain, these are the blocks. The chain is the cryptography or the hashes that can pull across. All it really is is a mathematical proof to say those boxes were secured at this time and we know that definitively. It's becoming very, very popular, but more importantly, it's becoming very scalable. Uh, and, being a, and, and people are now being able to do this um, in a way that uh, requires very little computing power and, and overhead so that um, it becomes much easier to do it for lower cost transactions or data. Yes, sir. Yeah, I would just push back a little bit. And Please. Add further that um, it's not only the, uh, the mathematical proofs that, uh, that secure uh, and make this data immutable, but rather the uh, game theoretic uh, structures uh, and uh, economic alignments that actually incentivize uh, the participation of the network. So I would be curious to know how, how do you see uh, the uh, immutability property of a distributed ledger within a uh, permission uh, network? That's a, that's a very good question. You and I could probably go back and forth on this a long time. Uh, let, me, let me add a caveat to what I said, and we'll see if you agree with me then. Okay. So his point was, um, when I say immutability, that guarantees that things can't be changed. Uh, and his point is, um, the, the way you do that is by having everybody co-opt and sort of operating on the same ledger. Uh, and that's a very good point. Um, maybe a better way to describe uh, an integrity guaranteeing um, approach that's a lower threshold of participation would be just making tampering obvious or tampering evident, which you would get with a permissioned uh, or non-permissioned ledger. Okay. And I think, I think for our purposes today, uh, so not to put too, too fine a point on it, um, but um, what we at least want to know is if something has been tampered with. Okay. Now, you're right. You're absolutely right. And I, and I, sh I should have been more uh, precise. So thank you for that. Um, but for, for our purposes today, what I would argue is, let's at least know if the data has been manipulated. The next level of, of guaranteeing would be to know uh, that it hasn't actually been changed and we know what the original data state was. Um, what I really want to get into, yes, sir. Please. On that line, how easy would, would it be to, um, to to give the impression that the data had been manipulated? And so it could cause a huge uh, uh, effort to, to track down what happened. That's another quote. Is that right? You know, um, th this is such a great time of the year to go to Yosemite. Um, and when I go to Yosemite, I always love to go with people who can't run as fast as me. Um, because inevitably when that bear comes, uh, I know that I'll be able to outrun them. And so, to answer your question, um, no system is perfectly secure. Uh, what we want to do is raise the cost to the attackers, and I, I don't mean to be flip. Um, my point is, um, you re we really just need to raise the cost of these systems such that A, we know when there's been tampering, but also so that the adversary needs to spend a lot more time and effort uh, to actually be able to do this and be able to do it in a way uh, that would be insidious and impossible for us to detect. Um, but that's a very good point. And, and you always want to think about that in terms of relative cost, uh, particularly as we get into policy responses. Which is a good segue. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, normally I would say policy responses. I actually don't have a response. I have questions. And I would love to talk these through uh, as, a, as a group. Uh, so, you know, again, there's some really interesting um, uses now of things like distributed ledgers. Uh, 
we don't see a lot of um, you know CIOs of these corporations that are saying, or even CISOs, excuse me, saying we need to make more data integrity guaranteeing investments. It's just it's not on their roadmap. It's not approximate risk. It's it's not something that it's not uh, the closest alligator to the canoe. Um, and so I, you know the first thing is. I came from DARPA before this, and I always think about how do you incentivize research? Because ultimately, you want to bring the cost curve down. You want to make these technologies much more stable, uh, easier to use. Um, you know, the only reason now people are using cryptography is because it's built in. Uh, that's how, for, from a security standpoint, you really need to make it simple and easy to use. Uh, and that also generally makes it more resilient. Yes, sir? Yeah, so that's exactly what it was. Uh, so blockchaining became popular and this has better cryptography, the security enclave processor has better cryptography than any server farm we've ever walked into. And so why isn't this there? Yeah, it's because I, we haven't figured out how to answer question one, I think, <laughs> is, the, is the short answer. But you know, we haven't, A, we haven't appreciated the risks. The risks aren't, um, really? the, the monet, well, the monetary impact, right? Because the, it's the risk to the bottom line It, it, it's cheap now. It wasn't cheap when they first decided we want to we want to anchor this in hardware, right? We want to create the uh, what was it the uh, S5 chip? You know, when they said that, right? Like that was a huge undertaking. That took a lot of upfront R and D investment. Um, and I, and I'm sure they leveraged government investments, right, in in cryptography to be able to do that, at least in applied cryptography. Um, I don't think we've made the same foundational investments yet uh, overall in guarantee. You're starting to see DARPA, you're starting to see DHS make some of these uh, to, to spur greater commercialization, but we still haven't seen the costs uh, of that really fall to the point of making them easy to integrate. Still, you know, blockchains real, right now are generally flat file systems. Uh, they don't do much to help you uh, if you're trying to uh, say, address uh, integrity concerns in a NoSQL database, right? Uh, so there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of applicability that we haven't yet reached because of that. So uh, I just don't know that it's well within the, gr the, the practical reach of many of these companies that frankly, whose security teams are so far behind the curve, they're just worried about catching up to patching, frankly. Uh, so unless you have something that's ready to go, that's proven, uh, it's it's really tough for them to, to consider it. I mean, that's the practical reality. I didn't. I never appreciated this when I was on the government side the way I do now. Just being on the vendor side, getting in and just seeing how bad it is, how bad these systems are. Everything is a cost benefit. Right. Right. Yes. Um, I'm wondering if you think that the, the incentive issue is tied to the great gap that exists between Washington D.C. and Silicon Valley. It seems to me that there is a gap in terms of the mindset and an analysis of the world as it exists today. And I'm wondering if there could be enhanced dialogue, if that might help technology companies to better understand the risks facing the United States. Uh, yeah, I, I would definitely say there's a gap, speaking of, of encryption. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that's a really interesting question. I think that we, I think in this case, you're, you're probably using uh, Silicon Valley as, um, uh, you know, as, as a general placeholder, right, for, for the tech community. Um, I, I see, uh, and I saw this a lot when I was in the government, both in the Pentagon and then in the administration, um, working in the interagency. Um, it, it, the, the people who rise to be very senior leaders in government, and you, you probably saw this too, especially in the State Department, um, they generally are, they're generalists, general policy makers. They, they don't, you don't find many that have deep technical backgrounds. Uh, many of them are very intimidated with even basic discussions. I mean, a lot of these people, particularly the ones on the Hill, the overseers, have never used a computer. Never. <laughs> never. Like, a, a good portion of the U.S. Senate has never touched a computer. I mean... They, they would very likely think that the old CD-ROM drives are cup holders. Like, that is a very plausible thing that they may think. <laughs> and, uh, you know, like that, we, we realized we had a huge baselining issue before we could even start to talk substance, which, was, which took months and months of investment. 
So, I mean, I, I think the problem goes way deeper than uh, a public-private divide. I mean, you have a, a whole generation of senior policymakers that have no exposure at all to the tech, let alone the underlying technology implications. Um, so I think that dialogue, uh, yes, we need to have much more. I think, I think more importantly, we need to be taking talent grooming it from outside of DC and then encouraging it to come in. Um, you know, and to, to plug Betsy's program here, I think this is a great example of, of the way you start to do that. But it, it's a huge problem and one that I don't even think we've, we've seen the very worst of it yet. Yeah, I think the, the challenge is really getting past some of the, the acute pain points. And um, in, in particular, um, the encryption debate really has um, created some, some scar tissue, I think, that's going to be tough to get over uh, for a lot of people, just, just in the way that process-wise it was handled. Um, but uh, that's a discussion probably for another day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so thank you for this talk. I love this topic. I wanted to kind of toss out Um, you know, this isn't necessarily a question, but I'm just bouncing them off. Yeah. So the first thing that troubles me is the uh, SSL and certificate authorities. And I think, you know, there was, people aren't familiar, there was this Chinese certificate authority that was caught uh, publishing uh, certificates for GitHub illegitimately. Uh, so, you know, when we talk about military logistics, relying on FedEx, they probably use SSL. We can talk about their API, but we can also talk about the fact that we don't necessarily trust their certificate authorities. So that's one version. And then a number of things that other, what kind of this long tail that are plucked under kind of distributed ledgers and stuff like that. There's still no way, you know, GitHub does have some assurances, but there's still no way to sign individual commits and put together uh, a compiled binary that we know was, was uh, you know, all the contributions came from trusted sources. That's still a big problem. Second big problem for me is that there's still no distributed public key infrastructure out there. There are key servers that are still, you know, very easy, well, maybe not very easy, but pretty easy probably to tamper with. Yeah, MIT probably easy enough to stand for and that's a big problem. And then DNS, also something that's potentially, we already know that, that governments have kind of done DNS poisoning, and there's still no kind of distributed blockchain style, so let's use the term, alternative to DNS. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and let me, let me add a uh, consideration for you. Yeah. Where does the majority of our vulnerability research funding go? And do we actually see any of the results targeted at these systems if indeed there are vulnerabilities I found? The yeah, I, well, I think the answer is we don't know for a reason. Yeah, yeah. Um, but much of it is not directed at these sort of public good systems. Yeah, and it really shouldn't be, right? If we're going to, and we can't have it both ways. If we're going to privatize all of these systems, then we need to make sure that these security measures are public good. Yep. Um, I, the, the point that you just made, in my opinion, should be at the top of the priority list um, for the next uh, OS OSTP, you know, technology policy in the administration. And I, I hope that there's more writing and uh, much more publishing. So if you're thinking about grants for research <laughs> areas, <laughs> honestly, like, great at plugging well, <laughs> well, here's the thing, and, and you know, uh, let me let me defend the people in the White House right now who are aware of this problem, but there's very little actuarial data. You know, obviously, we've seen some high-level, um, high-profile SSL vulnerabilities just in the past two years that have drawn attention to the problem. But when you're operating at that level, you have a finite number of hours in the day. You have a finite number of dollars to invest. Um, you really have to make those investments based on your awareness, you know, actuarial data. And, and this is one where uh, there's individual appreciation for how troubling it is. I don't know that there's yet sort of the critical mass of research and data to really draw attention to it. And so, again, if there were one area that I think we should, because this is a huge public good. And I, I don't even think there's enough recognition of just how uh, important that public good is for the national economy. So, so anyway, you, you, that's another topic that you'll get me all fired up on. Last question. No, just, you know, the Internet Archive is trying to look at these issues, at least from a web level. 
they're trying to figure out how to get some of the immutable data stored. It locks down each web page with a snapshot. It. So that, you know, at least at that level. So I know that they're having these discussions actively, at least you know, in, in that one subset of the internet or, or sort of our cyber stuff as a whole. So, but, but there are the quasi-public-private agencies like that that are trying to think well for the public good and you know, cooperating with the EFF to think about how we start to create these kind of mechanisms going forward. And maybe try to create some sort of big umbrella in you know, this school to think about how we can you know, facilitate that dialogue and bring everybody together under a big tent to think well about it. That's encouraging. I mean, you definitely hear about pockets of people who are thinking about it, but again, not, not really the critical mass to start moving the needle. But, um, well, anyway. Guys, thank you so much. Uh, I always get a lot more out of this. So. so Chris, we have a small token of appreciation for your time. Oh, thank you. So thank calm. you so much again. Appreciate thank it. you to everyone. Um, our next few talks will be in November, so we have a little bit of a break. But we love seeing you, and hope we'll see you again. Thanks again.